Welcome back to the podcast, Bribe, Swindle or Steal. I'm Alexandra Roggi, and today we're talking about some anti-corruption developments in China. Joining me is Wendy Weisong. Wendy is the managing partner of Steptoe's Hong Kong office. That's also Trace's partner law firm, so we're very grateful. Wendy focuses her practice on white collar criminal defense and international domestic and regulatory compliance. Wendy, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Alexandra, for inviting me. China's Central Commission for Discipline Inspection, the CCDI, recently released new guidance on anti-bribery. Can you walk us through what these changes mean with respect to China's existing policies and just flesh them out for us a little bit, if you would? Back in September of 2021, the CCDI issued some guidelines, and they called it the Opinions on Further Promoting the Investigation of Bribery and Acceptance of Bribes. And this really was an idea that was conceived and released by the primary anti-corruption arms of the Chinese Communist Party, that is, the CCDI and the National Supervisory Commission. And they are currently jointly working on ways to implement the guidelines. So this confidential party document is not readily available to the public but folks have gotten a hold of it, they've translated it, and you can find it uh, to review. When I reviewed it, I really had three takeaways in looking at it. And the first one has really gotten the most attention because sort of a reversal of the prior way that they were enforcing their anti-bribery rules. And what they did is they created a blacklist And so companies and individuals that are found to have paid bribes in China, whether to public officials or private persons, are going to be put on this blacklist. And if you're on that blacklist, you can't conduct business in China. And essentially what they've done is they've reversed the practice that had been in place for years of really focusing on the bribe takers, the government officials. Now they've broadened that or announced their intent to broaden that to include bribe payers. So if you're put on this blacklist, it's not clear what's going to happen to your ongoing assets. If you have the business in China, it's conceivable that the Chinese government has the discretion now to expropriate them for its own purposes. And certainly the loss of a large market in China is going to be significant for any business. There's no express time period for the blacklisting. There's no materiality threshold. We think that there'll be further details or not. It's a different focus now. It's a broader focus. And the law was written, so they didn't have to amend the law. But they've interpreted it now to include both government and private sector bribery, bribe takers and bribe givers. They announced that there's going to be key industry sectors, finance, environmental protection, production safety, food and medicine, disaster relief, social security, education, and Medicare. Broader focus is the first takeaway. The second takeaway that I had and a number of folks have had is the emphasis on and the direction to look for opportunities abroad. So if there is a settlement with an overseas authority where a company admits having paid bribes or being involved in bribery in China, China can potentially raise what they call a carbon copy prosecution. So if you have a DPA where a company acknowledges involvement in bribery that took place in China, you could get blacklisted, as I have mentioned, or you could actually be prosecuted in China. Now, that's very significant because a lot of the FCPA enforcement actions have involved bribery in China, in fact, more than in any other country. This is nothing new because a lot of other countries do this piling on. Sometimes it's coordinated, sometimes it's not. You know, you see the Airbus prosecution, which was a very layered prosecution with France, the UK, and the United States, but the bribery took place in China. Is there going to be a follow on prosecution? Is the question by China? The third takeaway that I had was that China is going to be a lot stricter in the sentencing and punishments. There's not going to be credit given necessarily for mitigating circumstances. Now, currently, or I guess before the guidelines were issued, if a bribe payer came forward and self-disclosed or actively cooperated, there would be some mitigation credit. 
But it said now that's not necessarily the case. You might end up having any property that was obtained through bribery be confiscated, any other advantages from bribery, any access to positions, any qualifications, all of that could potentially be revoked or canceled. Finally, I just note that it used to be that there was some sentencing disparity between state and non-state actors. That's no longer the case. The only thing that there is sort of now a difference is that if, and this again was alluded to in the guidelines, is that if the bribery total in an especially huge amount is how they described it. If the bribes paid were especially huge, the sentence could go up to life imprisonment. It was just sort of renewing the emphasis that's being placed on bribery, expanding the focus, and really sort of bringing the direction and the focus of the bribery prosecutions more in line, I guess, with bribery prosecutions and enforcement globally. So it was an interesting guideline and certainly caught a lot of people's interest. That is a great summary and a lot of information. I have a number of follow-up questions. Before I ask you those, do you have a sense of what prompted the new guidelines? What is behind this? Why now? You can't really get into the mind of these particular lawmakers too much, but we do know and we have seen an increase in enforcement and an expansion and a codification of laws in a number of different regulatory regimes. I also work in the area of export controls and sanctions, and there's certainly been a number of regulations and laws written in that area as well. And so we think what I've noticed is that this is just an attempt to regularize and codify a range of laws and regulations to become more transparent and to be more commensurate with laws globally that have been enforced and implemented in other jurisdictions. And I do look at their laws, China's laws, and consider them. And I think that a lot of the weaknesses and loopholes that have plagued other uh, laws like the FCPA have been closed. And that China is really emphasizing the fact that their laws in some ways are a lot stricter and a lot tighter, more analogous to the UK Bribery Act in some respects. So I think it's sort of maybe a rising tide of regulations across the board is driving this, and this may just be part and parcel of that. Let's talk about the blacklist a little bit. And there may just not be this sort of information yet, but do we know if it will be public? Do we know if there's an appeals process? Is is there any detail at all at this point? We don't know if there's going to be details that are going to be published. We do know, however, that it's actually been populated. In December of 2021, if you looked at the CCDI website, there were 75 companies and 100 and eight management personnel in the tobacco industry who are listed as suppliers with bribery behavior by the State Tobacco Monopoly Administration. So these listed suppliers were all barred from any new procurement projects in the tobacco industry from one to three years. And there was also an announcement at the same time on that website that said several districts in Ningbo have established blacklists for bribers so that if there are bidders on government investment projects, you have to screen for criminal records of giving bribes and they'll be rejected from even being allowed to bid in these government engineering construction projects. So it's already being implemented. You know, what you do if you're actually on the blacklist is not clear. What they did in order to get on the blacklist is not clear. How you can avoid getting on the blacklist, obviously don't be caught paying bribes. Those are details that may or may not actually explicitly be published. This is moving quickly. Did I understand you correctly, though, that there is a centralized list, the one you referred to with respect to the tobacco industry, but there may also be separate regional lists? Will people have to look in different places in order to vet anybody they want to work with in China? 
That's a good question, Alexandra, because as you know, the regional enforcement agencies all have their own lists. But from what we've seen and just looking at the central CCDI website, there's definitely folks being put on these black lists. I think it's probably going to be a question of looking at any repositories in the regional enforcement agencies, but also looking to the enforcement abroad. So if you've got a company that has admitted to bribery overseas and you're working with that company, you know, questioning whether or not that company is going to be allowed to bid or whether or not you put them as a bidding partner is going to be something that companies are going to need to consider. Let's move to the issue of settlements, because that's really going to be important to multinationals operating in China and will presumably influence their decision about whether or not they want to satellite. It sounds like an anti anti anti-piling on provision. (laughs) What are you taking away from that? Is the goal, and I realize it's impossible to know, but is the goal to ensure that China has a place at the table in any settlement, or is it to deter settlements outside of China, settlements with, for example, uh, the United States or the UK? They've always had the power to do these prosecutions. I mean, any country can do that. You know, they see that bribes are being paid in their own country, and then they see the United States or the UK or, you know, whatever jurisdiction enforcing their own laws against their companies, companies that they have jurisdiction over for activity that took place in China. And they could always do that. But it was a question of whether or not they were actually going to take the steps to do this. And what the guidelines do is it encourages the enforcement agencies to take those steps and to the CCDI and the Procuradora to go ahead and prosecute these cases because the other countries have done all the hard legwork. They publish the admissions and the statement of facts, just taking those and building a prosecution from that. And they could always do that. It's not really a new authority, but it is encouraging the enforcement agencies to take a look at what's going on overseas. And I think anybody that's done these investigations and faced multi-jurisdictional settlements, there's always one eye on what the home home base is going to do. I know when I did cases and that investigations where the bribery was taking place in China, there was always sort of a question as to whether or not you self-disclosed to China at the same time you were disclosing to the other governments. And there really wasn't a mechanism to do that. And so there was sort of a thought, well, China's perhaps not going to enforce their own prosecutions. Well, now I think that's probably not a safe bet anymore. I don't think what you're going to see with China is the same level of cooperation and coordination that you saw in, say, the car wash prosecutions or Airbus, any number of the joint international enforcement actions I think that's not something you're probably likely to see in China. So you'd end up not really with a quote unquote global settlement. You'd end up with something that would be more individual and seriatim is is my forecast for this. I don't think it's trying to discourage settlements with the other governments. There's not too much that they can do about that. But a company that is thinking that they're going to have to also be facing China is going to need to pay very close attention to what they're admitting to. And the other governments have a lot of discretion as to which charges they bring and publicize. So if there's bribery that's going on in a bunch of different countries, maybe the bribery that took place in China will not be the highlighted bribery scheme, and it would instead be focused on bribery that took place elsewhere. And that would be a point of negotiation for the company that's talking with those other countries. Interesting. So rather than handing the completed settlement to China to pursue on their own, work with the prosecutors and other countries to tailor uh, the, the admissions, that makes a lot of sense. This does sound like a lot of messaging. As you point out, this doesn't change the powers of Chinese enforcement agencies. It highlights them. It sounds like it's China's 
attempt to send a message to the business community and perhaps to enforcement agencies elsewhere that they're stepping up. I'm curious if it's been accompanied at all by any messaging on the Chinese pursuing Chinese company misconduct abroad. When I first heard about this, I thought, well, they're moving closer to the US FCPA or the UK Bribery Act, but that isn't the case. This is a focus on bribery within their borders. There has been, to my knowledge, no prosecution by China of Chinese companies for bribery outside its borders. Does that change with this? Is that impacted in any way? No, it's very much focused on bribes taking place in China. But in terms of who the targets of those prosecutions would be, you know, we're certainly watching a lot of the bribery and corruption charges that are raised in China, and they go after their own. It's not a question of just looking at foreign corporations that come to China. There is very much, and we've seen it, you know, with all of the data-owned entities, management that get charged with bribery or acting contrary to the interests of the state, that kind of various euphemisms and things like that that are being used. So this isn't just targeted at foreign corporations. They'll look after their own as well. So I don't think it's just trying to be extraterritorial. I think, you know, after reading the vast bulk of the FCPA cases that have a China component to them, I think it's just a matter of them saying, you know, wait a second, you know, why are these other jurisdictions penalizing acts that take place in our territory? We should do that as well. I think there's messaging that's going to the companies, but I think even more there's messaging that's going to their own internal enforcement agencies and to the party to go at, you know, the CCDI inspectors and their prosecutors not to be afraid to prosecute and use the full panoply of tools that they have. It's in some ways just, I mean, this is an internal document and it's directed for an internal audience, I think. This is really interesting, Wendy, and we're going to have to catch up on it again in a few months when there are more developments in it. It's been more widely discussed within China and perhaps accompanied by a little bit more guidance. But before we wrap up, and you've touched on some of this, What is your advice to multinational companies operating in China as a result of this? Is there anything they should do differently to prepare or respond? Or is it compliance as usual, more of the same? I'd like to think it's compliance as usual, more of the same. That companies that are aware of the risks of doing business in China or anywhere in the world, this is just another facet of what they need to consider, that they may be subject to prosecution in their country where they operate or country's home base, but they shouldn't be just taking it for granted that they're just going to be facing U.S. or foreign regulators. They're going to be facing the regulators that are right there around the corner that are watching what they're doing and making sure that they're abiding by the local laws in the jurisdiction where they operate. Wendy, thank you so much. It's late in Hong Kong. I appreciate you staying up for this and it's always good to chat. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Alexandra.